Thank you. Oh, heavens. Microsoft wants to update right now. <laughs> of course it does. All right. So um, I must say I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, I, I came in yesterday. There was a, a conference for bookstores that were really interested in what the future is for campus stores across this country and whether the word book is going to be in their title at all. Um, and then we're going to be spending some time at different institutions uh, in Ontario. You may or may not know that BC is really pushing the envelope uh, in this country when it comes to open education. Uh, and part of that has to do with government support from the Ministry of Advanced Education. Uh, but I think there are several other factors as well that are at play over there. So my, my hope today is to talk about not just open educational resources, but really more broadly, uh, open educational practices uh, and how these might easily be harnessed by any of us uh, to serve our students, yeah, but as faculty as well, uh, to serve pedagogical innovation, uh, and then more broadly, to serve our institutions. But uh, just a quick show of hands, so I have a sense of the composition of the group. How many of you um, teach in the classroom? Okay. And how many of you interact with students more or less weekly? Okay. So I'm covering almost everybody in the room with those two questions. All right. So I want to start with um, a very simple question, or not even a question really, maybe a, a, some common ground. It's February. I want you to think back to maybe a month ago and think about those first two weeks of the semester and think about the most common emails that you get from your students at the start of the semester, and perhaps even two weeks before the semester begins. Think about what those questions are and take a look at this. The scene is this, it's a dark night. <laughs> a student visits a faculty member's office. Very simple question. Is that familiar at all? <laughs> There's a good argument that's made. <laughs> and of course, it gets even better. <laughs> it's interesting to talk about ethics in this situation. So I think as faculty and perhaps people in the bookstore and anyone who interacts with students, I think we're all familiar with the traditional practice of new additions with cosmetic updates and the grief that that causes students, but also faculty, as we feel part of a, a problem that we feel we're challenged to, to change or address. So I want to start with this as a brief reminder. Many of you will be aware of the UN's Declaration of Universal Human Rights, but few of us recognize that there's actually language in there about the importance of accessibility uh, to higher education. But more and more, what I see is that the way in which higher education is structured itself only serves to reinforce social inequality instead of being a, a vehicle to overcome it. And this might be one example of that. So I think we're all aware of the last several decades that it's been a very systematic decrease in the amount of government support of higher education. This is just one illustration of that. But as government funding has decreased, the proportion of the burden that's borne by students has only increased. In Ontario, for example, right now, students actually are responsible for more than 50% of the cost of their own education. Right? This comes from tuition principally, but also other uh, fees, ancillary fees, and places where they've received permission to assign those. But more than 50% is coming from students. But again, even as someone who interacts with students every day, I don't think we often get a real sense of, of the impact or how widespread this impact is across our student body. You may not know, for example, that more than 50% of our students require a student loan simply to be in the classroom. That's astonishing. 50% or more of Canadian undergraduates hold a student loan right now. Moreover, six years ago, federal student loan debt in this country exceeded $15 billion. That was the debt ceiling. Then they had to change the debt ceiling to raise it to 19 billion, and that is forecasted to be exceeded in the year 2020. This is changing. And this is just federal student loan debt, I should add. Federal student loan debt is roughly 60% of entire government student loan debt. So it doesn't include provincial debt, for example. So it's a much, much broader problem. Uh, that snapshot is something I took just this morning. So that's a very up-to-date figure of student loan debt in this country. As an individual student, about $29,000 is the average at this point. And what's worse is that three years after having graduated from university, barely a third of our students have managed to free themselves 
from the shackles of this debt. That picture on the left is, is, is something that I, I find quite remarkable. A few years ago, UBC had a marketing campaign that they used to celebrate their graduates around convocation. And so they placed these posters around campus and they allowed students to fill in whatever was most memorable. And this one, as you can see, was filled in by an uncomfortably honest student. It's true. More than this, so Ontario students, for example, when you think about how are they paying for these increasing costs, they're working more, and I don't think it's a surprise to any of us who work with students every day. Right? We see them trying to work, in some cases working full-time while going to school full-time, and there's these decisions that are made between groceries or textbooks. So they are working a, a whole lot more. I think when many people who are senior faculty today were undergraduate students, it was the case that you could work a summer job and have that cover the cost of uh, your, much of your higher education over the year. That's certainly no longer the case at all. Moreover, we also know tangibly that when student loan debt goes from $1,000 to $10,000, program completion rates plummet from 59% to 8%. And this is where administrators and institutions get really interested about the financial implications of these increasing costs. Now, when I'm talking about increasing costs, obviously we're talking about many things. We're talking about tuition, and I don't think there's anyone in this room who individually controls tuition for this university, uh, nor for that matter, cost of living. But one area when we talk about costs that, that I think we have much more control over than we realize, of course, is the costs of textbooks. So it's against this backdrop that I'm gonna remind us that the cost of textbooks has escalated rather dramatically over the last few decades. Over 1,000% since 1977, that's more than three times the pace of inflation, which is the other line you're seeing over there. Over the last decade, it's been about 82%. So it's not the same at all as what many of us would have experienced. We now live, remarkably, in the era of the $400 textbook. I don't think that's something to be proud of. Students across the country have organized themselves, and there are social media campaigns that are on right now. If you look for the hashtag textbook broke, you'll see students coming out of bookstores across the country taking pictures of the receipts, showing the amount that they've spent that morning and, and tweeting those pictures across, across uh, the World Wide Web. On the left, you're seeing an example of a whiteboard. This was a campaign by a student <coughs> union uh, where the students are, again, just checking off how much they've spent that morning or, or for that semester's textbooks. And you see from under $100 all the way to over $1,000. Number of students are writing in, you know, too much and checking that off at the top. But my personal favorite, can you see this one? my firstborn, <laughs> right? And it is funny, of course, but at the same time, there is, this is a, a social justice issue with a real human face. This is the reality. This is across the country. My alma mater, the University of British Columbia, had a 100% increase in the use of its local food bank by students this year, or last year, I should say. And the same thing is happening in Ontario. So again, we may not see this tangibly. We may see it in terms of students choosing not to buy their course textbooks and try to struggle through the course. We may see students asking us about older editions and the like, but this is actually what's happening. Right? They do a lot, and when we list a textbook as required, students don't automatically go buy the books anymore. This is not the case. These are some of the things that students do, and I think this shouldn't surprise anyone. This is not an exhaustive list. But when possible, they buy a used edition, perhaps at the bookstore, and that's if an edition hasn't changed just before that semester, rendering the previous one uh, you know, uh, worrying in terms of the mismatch in, co in, co in content. They buy it online from places like Amazon, which is also why you see a decrease in the amount that students are spending at university bookstores uh, in the amount, uh, on, on textbooks. They resell at the end of the semester, if possible, if the, dish, if the edition hasn't changed midway through the semester, rendering their $200 textbook worth, what, $10? Um, and again, when I say reselling, many students do want to resell the textbook, but some don't. And they feel compelled to to recover the cost, even though ideally they would like to keep certain books as a reference. More and more students are buying the textbooks together in groups, shared purchases where they all need it at the same time. They're using library loans, interlibrary loans, photocopying, heavens, I used to do that when I was an undergraduate. And more and more students are realizing that they can access international editions that are significantly cheaper with some mismatch in content, but more or less the same book. In many cases, they'll take the risk. They, you know, they get the cautionary notes from me in the classroom about, well, you could, but you're gonna be responsible for the changes across the editions if there are new questions in that question bank or something else. They know this, but they're making a cost-benefit uh, trade-off and they're saying, I'm gonna go ahead and, and do this. And in some cases, they're not really wrong. I mean, how can you argue with, with this, for example? 
I love this quote. <laughs> They say they're not wrong necessarily, and as I said, I think we're all aware of the of the of the uh, strategy of cosmetic changes: change the pagination, change a couple of little images here or there, add a couple of problem sets. Yay, two hundred dollars brand new, and that is the traditional practice of publishers because, of course, once a book is old enough, a year old or so, the used book market is really what what drives the business, and they don't get any revenue from that whatsoever. So you can understand it from the publisher's point of view. On the other hand, I should say, faculty have a role to play as well. I think we do have to think much more deeply about how we use these books. There's nothing more frustrating to a student than being assigned a book, spending $200 to buy it, and then realizing that you only really needed a couple of chapters from the textbook. Right? This is true, and this does happen. I empathize with this. But students actually know about this, so they actually venture to places. They, they go to this particularly dark corner of the internet, which many of you know about. It's called ratemyprofessor.com, <laughs> right? And they read through the comments, and they look to see which instructor is actually using all of the resources that are assigned as required. Right? This is real, by the way. I didn't make this up. This, somebody's actually created a Rate My Prof, uh, Profile for Master Yoda, which I think is brilliant. It's very helpful, but not very clear. <laughs> but. But yes, there's actually tags on there about uses the textbook. And the students are looking at this. And they, if there's multiple sections for the same course, they're choosing sections in which you either have a lower cost textbook or in which the textbook is not being used and therefore they can go without it. And even worse, perhaps, in increasing numbers, students are seeking to download illegally uh, copies of their textbook where they're available. And in some cases, they're motivated to uh, buy the textbook in whatever format, digitize it, and provide it for free. I'm going to read out a section of this. This is at Penn State. Penn State, you are gouging your students. We would be willing to pay a fair price for this book, but that would be far south of the $200 you charge at the bookstore. Fix this, lower the tuition. Maybe students like me won't spend, spend several days scanning your book and putting it online. <laughs> I like the request also to please clean the bathrooms on the first floor of Willows. This is just everything I need from the university right now. But this is happening in, in increasing numbers. But imagine this, the structure is set up such that students feel this is a preferable option. Right? Violating the law is preferable than spending the money when they're in this position. How prevalent is this? We have data, which we recently collected in BC, which mimic the data that were collected in the United States. Uh, a very big study, thousands and thousands of students, um, st which was uh, done in Florida, looking at student textbook behaviors. So we know that more than 60% of our students do not purchase a course textbook for at least one of their undergraduate courses, most likely an elective course. But 35% actually select and take fewer courses because of textbook costs. And down here in the middle, 23% routinely go without textbooks for their courses. So this is, this is interesting, but this is the reality. And this is where the institution's bottom line starts to get affected as well. This is, this is not just about students should know the value of it and they should pay for it. This affects pedagogy. So maybe I'm going to shine a light a bit more now on faculty. And this is uh, maybe a representative picture of, of faculty workload. Because um, I think we all know what this is like. We have tremendous demands on our time. We're trying to teach a number of courses. We're trying to keep up with our scholarship. We're trying to keep up with uh, our service obligations. We're trying to, God forbid, spend a little time with our families before we collapse in an exhausted pile at the end of the day. And it's in this environment that we get these wonderful, friendly faces knocking on our office doors every, every couple of weeks, right? these smiling, cheerful publisher representatives. And they say, we've got this wonderful, magnificent solution for you. It's going to solve all your problems. You don't have to do any work. This is plug and play. We've got the textbook. We've got a question bank, so you never have to write a single question. We've got an automated system where you can randomly assign questions and digitize that. We've got online adaptive automated quizzing, which is really, really effective, they say, and really assist student learning as well. We're going to send you these wonderful, wonderful PowerPoint slides, which if you've ever taken a look at, are not particularly wonderful. <laughs> but, but they make it seem as though this is, this is your out. And I understand this, because I've been in this situation. Right? You, if you've ever empathized with the state of an adjunct who's told two weeks in advance of the semester what course they're going to be assigned, this is very useful. If you've taught a survey course at the you know, first year level where you've specialized in your graduate work in one area but you're expected to teach 16 areas, you rely heavily on these kinds of resources. It's completely understandable. Right? But at the same time, I think we're facing what's called a principal agent dilemma. This is when the individual making a decision for a large group of people is themselves not bound by the consequences of that decision. We never pay that cost. 
And I think a good symptom of a principal agent dilemma is when a faculty member doesn't actually know the precise cost of the textbook that they've assigned for that semester. It reveals a bit of a disconnect in my mind. But if you do have these conversations with those smiling faces in your office, the publisher representatives, right? The first thing they'll tell you typically is, well, we've got different formats because we care about students. We've got the hard cover, right? we've got the soft cover, we've got the loose leaf binder version and all sorts of other options. And then of course they'll talk about eBooks, the cheapest option on their plate perhaps in some cases. And this is a, a good example. This is a, a, an actual cognitive psychology text that I would have used previously. Um, so $189 or so, plus taxes, of course. Or you could buy the ebook at the low, low cost of 102 But I'm going to suggest that this is really a wolf in sheep's clothing. Right? This is a situation in which students uh, receive an ebook which often has a limited license. So after six months or whatever it is, the license will expire, which means they can't resell it, which means if they're interested in lifelong learning, too bad, which means if they have to retake the course, if they want to, to get a better grade, too bad, you have to buy it again. It's locked within a, within a proprietary platform that's not particularly com compatible with assistive learning technologies. So when I think about, again, the structure of higher ed, if students can't afford the required course materials, who are we saying, higher ed, who, who are we saying belongs in higher ed? And if students can't access it, if it's not compatible with assistive learning technologies, who are we saying belongs in higher ed? And I think these are questions that interest me. So the embedded assumptions. In some cases, I think also, because of the inability to resell these licensed uh, e-textbooks, students often end up spending more when they buy these books than if they bought a hardcover and actually resold it at the end of the semester. But that's a different issue. So, but it's more than this, right? It's more nefarious than this. This is my vision of publisher meetings. <laughs> but. You know, I, I joke about this in some sense, but I also know I've worked in departments where there are specific deals that are struck. And they say, if you go adopt our textbook for the next three year cycle, you will receive dollar value, $3 per, per textbook sold for your students. And we'll put that into a scholarship fund for your students, which is a bit like affixing, I think, a thousand leeches onto the student body and then <laughs> donating the, some of the collected blood for one victim. <laughs> it's a really strange model. Or they'll start to suggest that, oh, do you have a conference? Do you have a meeting? Do you have an articulation committee meeting? You want to, we can sponsor that. We can supply that. Do you have a student research event? Perhaps we can be there as well. So, and I think if the reality of this was really, really out in the open, if students were aware of some of these deals being struck, I think there would be cars burning in the parking lot, quite frankly. But I think we have to think about the ethics of this. And so again, I think there's a place for all of this. But at the same time, I think there's a much better model. And I think this is what the model is. So as you can see, that video was produced by OpenStax College, uh, which is just one of many, many, many providers of open ed resources for a variety of university courses. And I should say I have no relationship with OpenStax at all, but I just like that video. Um, 
But what we're talking about over here are open educational resources more broadly. These include open textbooks, absolutely, but not just open textbooks. These could be videos, interactive simulations, question banks, anything that is used for teaching and learning, but that is openly licensed. And that's the key bit. Because oftentimes people think that open ed resources are just resources that are available for free. But being free doesn't make it an open ed resource. Open resource means it's free with permissions. And it's the permissions that are the key bit. Uh, and typically we're talking about what are known as the five R's. So the, the one right in the middle, reuse, is the most obvious one. You can use these resources without asking anybody's permission. You're free to do that. At the top, well, you're free to retain these resources forever. The license doesn't expire, and you're free to redistribute it to your students, and your students can redistribute it beyond. You're not violating any copyright problem at all. And then finally, at the bottom. And at the bottom, those are the two R's that I think are particularly exciting for faculty. This is the ability to revise and remix and adapt the resources to suit your local context. And to me, this is what unleashes a layer of academic freedom that we usually don't think about as academic freedom. But I find too often, Faculty, we bend our courses to map onto the structure of a textbook instead of doing what we, I think, ought to, which is modifying the instructional materials to map onto our pedagogical and course goals. But this is what happens. So I'm curious, how many of you have ever in, been involved in or are aware of the process involving a, a committee adoption for a, decision, uh, for a textbook? Committee, uh, committee decisions? No? Wow, I'm surprised. This is encouraging. This suggests that the decisions might have been all individual. But in many places that I, that I visit, people talk about, and certainly in my institution, the highest enrolled undergraduate courses at the first and second year level, multiple sections, multiple instructors, they decide on a textbook across the entire department for that course. So that students who perhaps fail have to retake a course or just want to improve their grade, or they transfer between sections, won't have to spend money twice. And when they do this, Typically, we start with you know, what, 15 textbooks, all of the textbooks out there. We'll shortlist six, maybe, half a dozen. And finally, you end up with a textbook that everyone can live with, but that's not necessarily the exceptional textbook. It's the textbook that nobody blackballed, is what you end up with, really. And so no textbook is perfect, and we all know this. There are sections we would take out, ideally. You can do that. There are sections that are missing. We can add that. There are bits in terms of recent research developments that are not going to show up until the next edition three years from now. You can add those. You can embed your course assignments by scaffolding them within the readings themselves. And this is that layer of, of, of excitement, of, of innovation and pedagogy that I'm talking about with those permissions at the bottom. And you can even remix. For introductory psychology, there are at least three workable open textbooks for that course but they have different strengths and weaknesses, but we're able to remix those and take chapters that are especially uh, good or sections that are especially powerful in one book and add them to another one. So there's a lot of stuff that's open, that is considered open educational resources, and typically they are licensed with what's called a Creative Commons license. There are more than a billion items, objects, which have that license right now. So really, for the most part, once you're aware that these things exist, the problem becomes, how do I locate the one that's relevant and high quality and all the rest of that? And I'm going to try and help you with that before you leave today. But I want to give you an example of how broad this is. If you teach art history, you'll know that those textbooks are among the most expensive because of the copyright issues involved in reproducing those images. But the Rijksmuseum uh, in the Netherlands have openly licensed all of their collections of the masterpieces. You can download extremely high resolution images, including this self-portrait of by Van Gogh. Uh, literally, you could print a poster that size, affix it in your bedroom wall, and you'd just be paying the cost of printing. No royalties required. It's openly licensed. So you can use art. If you teach English Lit, you might be aware of Project Gutenberg and how they've digitized many of the classics of English literature. Those are available to students for free. University print shops and bookstores can print those out and bind them and sell them for free. Um, if you teach any of the major survey courses in the first couple of years, then you can go to places like OpenStax and look at some of their offerings. OpenStax is interesting because they're fun, uh, funded by the Hewlett Foundation, principally. Uh, so uh, heavy funding from them. And they've developed these textbooks, but also a lot of ancillary materials, question banks and all the rest of it for these courses. Uh, you could, uh, this is an ex illustration of their penetration. In the United States, one out of every five degree-granting institutions has adopted at least one OpenStax book. It's really quite significant in terms of how widespread their use is. Um, a really good place to go to, though, 
one that subsumes all of the OpenStax offerings is what's called the Open Textbook Library. This is based at the University of Minnesota, and they aggregate them. They're a larger sort of curated repository of open textbooks uh, from OpenStax, but lots of other providers. They have hundreds of them at this point. And what I really like about them is that they actively solicit faculty reviews. They go to faculty in those particular disciplines uh, and they, they solicit reviews, they post those reviews openly online, so you get a sense of their strengths and weaknesses as well. And in BC, of course, I mentioned government support because three years ago, the Ministry of Advanced Education provided a million dollars to produce or otherwise curate uh, textbooks for the 40 highest enrolled undergraduate courses in BC, which is really not that dissimilar from the 40 highest enrolled courses in, in Ontario. Um, and so at this point, we have, I think, 140 books in this particular collection. It extends to trades and technology as well. And you can see faculty reviews of these textbooks as well. Now, of course, I'm speaking over here as more of a biased insider uh, because I'm a co-author on, on more than one of these books. Uh, but again, these books are available. This is what it looks like. They can read them online, but you can download them in a variety of digital formats completely for free. Whether it's an e-reader, a Kindle, a laptop, desktop, iPad, it doesn't matter. It's not locked into a particular app. What I like about the online version, though, is it allows them to take full advantage of, of the power of, of interactive multimedia. So we're able to embed, for example, interactive simulations within the book itself. Um, there's a colleague of mine, his name is John Belshaw. He recently wrote an open textbook for pre-Confederation history, which obviously was not going to exist from OpenStax. So he wrote it with support from BC campus. And then he received additional funding, traveled across the country, and interviewed uh, leading historians with expertise in subtopic areas in history. And those interviews are embedded within the book itself. And that's just an illustration of the power of where this can go. So it's accessible to students everywhere. Uh, they get it immediately. They don't have to wait two, three weeks for their student loans to come in uh, across all devices permanently. And then if students are like me and they prefer print copy, that's where the bookstores come in. So in, in, in BC, Simon Fraser University runs a print-on-demand service because they have this machine which is called an espresso machine, uh, which prints out uh, open textbooks at cost. So a 600-page social psychology textbook, for example, costs my students all of $15, one five. Um, and normally it would be plus shipping, but we've actually found a way around that as well because we have an interlibrary loan shuttle that goes between all of our campuses every week. And so we thought, let's just take advantage of that. So now uh, the, the SFU bookstore delivers these books to institutions across the Lower Mainland in BC via the intercampus uh, loan uh, library bus. It's incredible. So again, this is just the start, and we're able to keep it alive and updated really, really quickly. In psychology, in fact, over the last year, we've seen a tremendous number of uh, developments concerning methods in, inter in terms of the shift to open science practices out of a desire for greater transparency, accountability, but also to strengthen the reproducibility of findings within the discipline. And this is all something we've been able to add. So more broadly, this is what we know as of very recent numbers. Globally, open textbooks have been adopted in a way that displaces traditional materials and collectively saves students that much money. Within BC, I know we've saved students more than a million dollars, and my own institution has surpassed, I think, 100 course adoptions at this point. But this is only the beginning. But at the same time, being free, that's exciting, and I think that's important, and, and that's relevant if social justice is important to you. But at the same time, I find quite correctly, that faculty are not principally making decisions based on the cost of materials. That's a factor, but it's not the principal factor. I think principally we're concerned uh, about what's the best, what's the best for my class, what's going to help my students the most, and so we start to ask the question of quality. Right? And this is where the question often uh, comes up, well, if it's available for free, how good can it be? Right? It's a fair question. But I think in many ways the question is the wrong question uh, because, of course, they're not free. Uh, there are major, major philanthropic, philanthropic organizations that fund their development or government in some cases. But yes, it's free to students, absolutely. So for comparison, here's a big, big survey of uh, perceptions of the quality of traditional publisher-supplied uh, resources, just so we have a somewhat of a control group for comparison. And what you're seeing in this graph, this is from a, a Babson survey report that was published, uh, I guess, now a year and a half ago. 
If you group together uh, the individuals who think that the resources are excellent and good, that's just about 50%, right? Um, or if you add the rest as well, perhaps we're up to you know, 75, uh, sorry, 60, uh, 65%. So 65% uh, are saying uh, that, well, it's either uh, average or good in quality. The rest saying that I don't really have a particular opinion. But if you look at OER, uh, you start to see that there's a much larger green section because there's so little awareness. So people really don't have opinions about open educational resources as much because they haven't encountered them, you don't know what they are, they don't know, you don't know what they look like in person. And to be fair, there's great variation in the quality of OER. Uh, some, especially in recent uh, year or two, has, has been very, very strong. But the older stuff from five, six years ago were typically just text with not much interactive media built in, and they were relatively weak. But with OER, what you find is roughly, what, 30% who have an opinion uh, are saying it, it, it's good or excellent. Uh, and roughly 9% overall are saying it, it's not as good, or no, it's, it's average, I'm sorry. But if you, again, if you look at this as a proportion of people who have an opinion, you find that 80% of people who have an opinion about traditional resources think it's good or excellent, and 75% of people who have an opinion about OER think it's good or excellent. What we found in BC as well is when we compared adopters of OER, people who've actually used it in their classes, those people have much higher opinions of OER than people who've never encountered them. So again, part of this is exposure makes a difference, interacting with them makes a difference. And I know that the Open Textbook Network, uh, or sorry, Open Textbook Library, when they ask faculty to review the books, they post all of them online, by the way, regardless of what they say, because they want an authentic uh, account of those books they find that roughly 40% of the faculty who review open textbooks end up adopting them, which is quite something. Um, this is what students think, on the other hand. And this is just uh, surveys in, in uh, the two different colors bars are just uh, another instructor and myself when we ran confidential surveys at the end of the semester when we began adopting these open textbooks. So the students obviously like the quality, and fair enough, you might say, what do students know about the quality? But this is their perception to, to, to go alongside the faculty perception. We also asked them about convenience, and of course they like that, they like the portability, the access. They really, really like the cost savings, but that's a no-brainer, right? That's the easiest question you could possibly ask them. You're gonna get a ceiling effect over there any day. But we also asked them what is the average cost of textbooks that you typically spend across your other courses. And typically it's around that $150 mark. That's pretty average uh, for a typical course. Having said that, I, I do feel that it's somewhat appropriate that this graph looks like someone extending a middle finger. It feels somehow quite appropriate. <laughs> we also asked them at the end of the semester, you know, having used this book for the entire term, would you now have preferred to actually spend money and buy a traditional textbook? And overwhelmingly, they say no. And typically, these are not numbers that you see with traditional books. Students don't fall in love with their traditional textbooks in the same way. Of course, there's the nice halo effect of the cost savings, but it lingers, and you see it in your course evaluations at the end of the semester as well. I'm gonna show you some comments that are not from my course evaluations, but are also part of qualitative data that we collected from an online anonymous survey. So if students had no reason to lie over here. We asked them about, again, feedback about all aspects of, of the open textbooks. And of course, they talk about the convenience, all of that. They talk about cost savings. They talk about accessibility. But this one in the middle is the one I've blown up a bit because it's, as an instructor, this is one that really matters to me. I would not have bought this textbook because it's an elective. I would have possibly walked away with a C. Now I might actually get an A minus. And that's meaningful, right? So at this point, there have been 13 peer-reviewed studies published in the literature that look at the efficacy and the impact on educational outcomes of open textbook adoption or OER adoption more broadly. Uh, the aggregated size of the sample is about 65,000 students. And I'll show you two quick examples of what that looks like. Uh, one of the best studies that I've encountered was published last year. Uh, this was a quasi-experimental study where the sections were randomly assigned to be open textbooks or traditional textbooks, of course. So you're not assigning students within the same class, because that would be a bit strange to do uh, in this case. So they knew that they had the potential problem of non-equivalency of groups, and so they used propensity score matching. They collected data on 10 different variables to match the students before they made this comparison. So they're doing a reasonably good job. And what they found across these 16,000 students, this was across 10 different institutions across a set of 15 courses, 
they found that the students with OER had lower withdrawal rates from the course overall. And I should explain these numbers. Uh, what I'm saying over here is only two of the sections uh, actually showed a difference between the OER and traditional courses. And those two were the uh, OER sections. So OER, two out of the 15 sections um, had lower withdrawal rates, and those were the open textbook sections. The zero is that none of the traditional textbook sections had, 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 had uh, lower withdrawal rates. And then, of course, the 13 is, is showing that the majority of them show no difference in performance when it comes to that um, dependent variable. Um, when it comes to passing the course with a C minus or better, over here they were effectively looking at what's, what can be used as a prerequisite to go further within the discipline. Uh, and again, we're talking about five courses with open textbooks where they did better, one with a traditional where they did better, and nine where it's about the same. Higher course grades, it's similar, four, one, and majority, no difference at all. And they also looked at uh, how many courses they enrolled in the, the current semester and the following semester. Uh, and there, there was no, uh, it, it, there was a difference, but it was always that uh, students who enrolled in open textbook sections were enrolling in uh, an average of a little bit more, uh, a fraction of a course more on average uh, in the subsequent semester. So those cost savings are being channeled in a way that actually serves the institution more broadly. And I should say that all of the 13 studies say exactly the same thing. They've been conducted by, in different contexts by different researchers, but there's no one study at all that exists that demonstrates that adopting an open textbook negatively affects educational outcomes. Those, that, that one section and that one section is the only evidence across those 13 studies of that. Last year, my colleagues and I in BC conducted the first efficacy study in Canada to look at the different educational context. And this was across multiple instructors, multiple sections, but they coordinated it so the, so the course design was the same. It was all introductory psychology. And we had students enrolled in sections that were randomly assigned to be traditional textbooks, uh, where obviously the students spent uh, the usual amount of money that they would spend, and then open textbooks. But we also divided that into open print versus open digital. Because open textbooks are free in a variety of digital formats, but at a low cost in print formats. So we wanted to see if the nature of the resource itself might affect their educational performance. And what we found systematically was that there was no difference across any of the instructors uh, between the performance of students with open print versus open digital. The format didn't matter. We also measured whether those with a print textbook downloaded the digital and used that, and whether di the digital students ordered a print or printed at home. Uh, and we looked at that sort of uh, cross-fertilization uh, a bit. But the only case in which there was a difference was again a case where the traditional textbook students did worse at the first midterm exam of the semester. And that again is more likely in our minds uh, because of this delay in actually purchasing the textbook at the start of the term. And that's what we see more and more is that students do not purchase it, either because they're waiting for their student loan or they're waiting to see if they really need the textbook. Uh, and that's where you're seeing a performance. So I don't think there's something outstanding about open textbooks that makes performance better. I think it's an issue of access that we're seeing over here across the board. So this is a rubric that uh, a man called David Wiley has developed, and I quite like it. Mad, sad, glad, rad. Um, he's one of the fathers of open education. Uh, and what you're seeing over here is on the y-axis, the amount that students might spend on their course materials, ranging from zero to, it should probably say $400 at that point, but still $200, more or less. Um, on the x-axis, the percentage or proportion of students who complete the course with a C or better. And there's been a number of studies that looked at this. Uh, the one study I'm citing over here in particular was conducted at Mercy Community College in the US, where they moved from a traditional publisher's textbook combined with an online platform called uh, My Math Lab, I think, uh, to a, a, an open textbook for math with an open platform uh, for math quizzing as well. So $170 to essentially $5 for the open platform. Uh, and what they found was that just under 50% of the students with the commercial textbook passed the course with a C or better, uh, whereas 62% of the students with the open textbook passed the course with a C or better. And I like this rubric because I think first you have to look at the two gray quadrants. None, none of those should surprise you. Right? If a student doesn't buy a course resource for whatever reason, and they do badly, that's sad, but it's not surprising. If they spend money, they get the resource, and they do well, that's, that's glad in some way. I mean, you're happy. At least you, you did well. But it's the other two quadrants that are really interesting. Because if you spend the money and you don't do as well, that does make you a bit mad. On the other hand, you know, if you don't spend a lot of money at all and you're doing pretty well, just as well, or perhaps better, as the studies suggest, that is indeed pretty rad. 
And I think part of this is also unpacking some of the assumptions that we as faculty make every day. We like to assume that all of our students have access to our course materials when we know they don't. Of course, we also like to assume that all students who have the course materials are reading the course materials. Nice assumption there. And so I think we have a lofty idea in terms of where we are setting the bar for instructional materials. And that may be why we're not seeing a real difference at all in terms of impact. But that's a question for future investigation. So at this point anyway, it looks like open educational resources in general, but open textbooks in particular, are a bit of a win-win-win. So this is for students. Cost savings, no question. That's the easiest. Access, immediate access, permanent access across all formats. It's great. Portability, sure, and then course performance is typically the same, or where it's different, it's been slightly better. For faculty, though, this is the bit. Right? This is that layer of academic freedom. This is the ability to adapt, update, revix, re revise, contextualize, embed local examples, local statistics, take out what you don't need, really, really make it your own. And we're seeing that more and more, where departments are sort of fostering the editing and updating of a department to make it their own in this way. It's quite incredible. And then, of course, for the institution, where we're starting to see more and more studies that are collecting data about, about student movement and student mobility, and whether students are more likely to enroll in a program when you're advertising it as an open textbook or low-cost textbook programs. There are institutions that are starting to add uh, tabs when students search for courses during registration. Uh, check this box if you want to display only courses that have open textbooks or free textbooks or less than $40 a course on, on textbooks. And you're seeing registration pressure in that way. You start to see it in terms of retention. You start to see it in terms of program completion. And so again, when you look at the university as a, as a system, you're starting to see quite a positive impact, really. There is a loser in the room, of course, absolutely. And those are the traditional publishers. But there's no question in my mind that the open education movement would not have existed at all if it hadn't been for the nefarious practices of traditional publishers in the first place. So this is where I'm at personally at this point. Right? I don't always use a textbook. I teach upper level courses that don't have a textbook, niche areas. I'm used to putting together readings and other things. But when I do, I certainly prefer it to be open. And there's a variety of reasons why I feel that way. Part of it has to do with social justice, part of it has to do with pedagogical innovation, and really part of it is just allowing me to align my values in terms of what I believe in general and what I am doing in the classroom. But there are institutions that are taking this much further. In the United States, for example, places like Tidewater Community College have developed entire programs. There's a two-year business administration program, which is based on open textbooks entirely. Saves students about $3,700. Massive increases in demand for that program. The institution is seeing a tremendous benefit. Uh, so that's another step where this can go. But I want to spend a little bit more time also here, maybe 10, 15 minutes, talking not just about or we are anymore, but about the pedagogy side. And so for a moment, I want to take a step back and again ask you how much you identify with this. It's a question we get asked a lot, I know. And I know there's this major focus as well, whether it's from government or others, who do not particularly believe in the value of liberal arts education, and they push for all of this in employers and employees and skill development, sure. But I think when it comes to testing, of course, we, we often see multiple choice testing, which is ubiquitous. And when I say multiple choice testing, I'm talking about traditional, fact-based, not applied, drawn from a publisher test bank, for example, things that could be looked up, essentially, that doesn't really involve higher levels of cognition at all, or even metacognition, for that matter. But of course, we do more than that. We assign lab reports and research presentations. And let's not forget the research essays, because they can write research essays. We know that. But I'm going to, again, try to identify what I think is another problem in how we, how we typically operate. Not always a problem, but it's something that's worth questioning. Because I think, and I'm being optimistic over here, you assign a research essay, and a student spends hours working on the research essay, okay, hours. One person is going to read that research essay. And then, of course, we spend a good amount of time providing painstaking feedback to the students. What proportion of students pick up the assignment? And what proportion of students who pick up the assignment bother to read the feedback as opposed to looking at the grade and moving on? And so, you know, I, I think there's a number of problems <laughs> with the current setup. 
And I think when you, when you put together the hours that students spend for one person's eyes and the hours that we spend providing feedback for almost no one's eyes, there's a tremendous waste of human potential that we're, that we're exhibiting every day. And so many people have suggested words to describe the alternative. Some people refer to traditional assignments that are going to be seen by just one person as a disposable assignment, which is a, some, somewhat of a pejorative term, obviously. But the alternative to it, to it would be something that allows students to harness their energy, their potential, even their creativity, to produce resources for the commons. So imagine instead of asking students to write their 17th research essay, for example, that we ask them to create something, create what might be called a legacy assignment. <laughs> it's an odd term, I'll grant you. But something that lives beyond the course, that serves more than just the instructor. So I want to showcase a few examples of what this looks like in practice and some really, really neat examples of what people are doing in the field. One of my favorite examples comes from chemistry. Uh, there's a professor at the University of California at Davis. His name is Delmar Larson. Uh, and for a number of years, he's been developing and building what's called ChemWiki. What's fascinating about ChemWiki is it's not written by Delmar. So thousands of students across North America and now beyond have, as part of their course, assignments, writing, editing, revising, updating articles related to chemistry, but also a number of other STEM disciplines. Now, it's not students publishing on the web. There's a massive faculty board that oversees it. There's layers and layers of vetting and, and, and refining. And then finally, the faculty decide when it's accurate enough to go online. So it's not like Wikipedia, where you know, we worry about Wikipedia. Uh, and so we forbid students from citing it and all that. But, but this is much more controlled. This is reliable Wikipedia, if you will. But imagine that it's built by students. And this is student work that exists as some, something of an electronic portfolio of their academic work long after they graduate. But at this point, ChemWiki is the most visited chemistry website in the world. It's Wikipedia for chemistry. And this is student work. It's astonishing. In psychology, we've seen a similar thing as well. But I suppose before I talk about that, I should say the way they've built ChemWiki is that it's customizable. And you have dozens of institutions that suck out different versions of it uh, for their particular context. You also have logins for students, so you can actually have learning analytics to have a sense of when are they actually accessing the course materials. It's very neat. Delma first designed this with a traditional midterm exam and a final exam for his major survey uh, intro course. Uh, and then what he found was he was able to track the percentage of students in his classes that were accessing the required readings for that exam for the first time within 24 hours of the exam, the crammers, in other words. So he's able to start to use the learning analytics on the back end to tweak the course design moving forward as well. This is what I mean about the potential of this pedagogy. It's really, really neat to have access to this. In psychology, we've had for a while now the Association for Psychological Science, a major uh, professional body, has partnered with Wikipedia, in fact. Again, the idea being we complain about Wikipedia a, a hell of a lot, but this is taking some steps to actually address the problem. So again, thousands of instructors uh, working on this as course assignments, they're focusing on the psychology articles. We have a sense that these articles are unreliable, and we are right. right? <laughs> There's 8,500 articles in psychology or more than that. They're viewed quite a bit, but barely two-thirds of them have gone through any peer assessment. And I don't mean you know, uh, uh, peer assessment in, the, in a journal publishing sense. This is the Wikipedia community peer assessment, which is not the same thing at all. And even then, only 9% have achieved good article status. So it is bad, but students are using it a lot. It's their first point of reference. And frankly, for many faculty, it's the first point of reference as well. So this is trying to address that problem. And at this point, uh, Wikipedia's uh, initiative has, has expanded to a number of number of disciplines. Uh, and you've got instructors across all of these disciplines incorporating this as part of their course assignments. I must say it's somewhat humbling, though, as a faculty member, when I publish an article in, in a peer-reviewed journal, to realize that far, far, far fewer people are going to read my work than are ever going to read my students' work when it comes to this sort of a platform. That's a little humbling. But again, we talk about learning outcomes and what is the upshot of all of this? Are we sacrificing any, anything when we move from traditional assignments to these sort of legacy assignments, non-disposable assignments? And the research that exists suggests that that's far from the case. We are talking about a lot of skills, including familiarity with revision and resubmission, peer collaboration, receiving feedback, including from people outside of the course, uh, uh, and of course, digital literacy. And I mention that because I find you know, people throw around terms a lot like digital natives. In my, in my practical experience, I find that I know a lot more about digital platforms than my students do. So there's a lot of scaffolding and instruction that needs to take place. 
But here are what students think about it. This one at the top from the University of Alberta, Augustana. Favorite part, knowing that the information is being presented is valuable to someone. A sense of meaning and purpose, right? This is not just another busy work assignment. Feels awesome to free information. And they're talking about summarizing studies, the results from studies, and sharing that on Wikipedia. Student at the University of Toronto there. Encouraged by more than my grade, wanted to contribute to something longer lasting, bigger than myself. And then again, this sense of leaving your personal mark for something for others to learn from. They do care more about it. There have been studies that have looked at instructors and students that have participated in this sort of initiative and how have they felt after the fact. And there have been a lot of them. A lot of students have worked on these assignments. A lot of new articles created. But at the end of the semester, it looks like almost all of the instructors who've participated in this sort of an initiative would do it again. So it suggests that there's something real there and really has pedagogical value. But those are just two examples. Here's another one that comes from the fabulous NOBA project in psychology, where they run competitions for students, where students are asked to create two to three minute instructional videos or overviews of particular theories or psychological concepts. They license them openly, post them, upload them uh, on YouTube. Uh, and again, it allows them to really indulge with this creativity. They have cash awards for this as well. This is an international competition. And in last year's international competition, the top prize went to students at Simon Fraser University in Vancouver. There were others in India and Singapore and Ohio State. But it's incredible. $6,000 US, which is what, like 50,000 Canadian at this point. <laughs> but, but again, the, imagine this, that instructors across the world are now using this student-created video as an instructional resource for their classes. That's meaningful, deeply meaningful to students. It's exciting. Or you could even consider having your students, for example, I try to do this, write op-eds. This was a, an award winner as an assignment from the Social Psychology Network um, Action Award Teaching Competition last year, where, for example, they got their students to take their growing, budding knowledge in social psychology, write op-eds, and share their knowledge with the wider community. Terrific idea for an assignment that extends beyond the life of the course that really train students to communicate in a way that's accessible to a general audience, which is a really important skill, I think. Uh, but again, allows them to feel like it's more meaningful. All of these examples, I think, I'm, I'm trying to use them to, to, to make one point, and this is really the point. I think, whether we like it or not, the way in which we design assessments drives how and what students learn. And therefore, I think we need to pay much more attention to the design of the assessments. I think assessments are a vehicle an airplane, if you will, that are designed to take the, our students from where they are now to where they could be, or where we want them to go anyway. But in many ways, I think when we use traditional disposable assignments, it's really the equivalent of, of taking an airplane and choosing to drive it on the highway, which we could do. It's kind of a waste, though. It's, it's capable of so much more. And I think that's the point of this legacy assignment idea. This could even involve, of course, students working on developing, researching, updating, revising, providing illustrations for local statistics for open textbooks that do not have, let's say, Canadian editions, and working on those. And if all of this talk of, of OER or open pedagogy sounds familiar, it might be because many of you will be familiar with open science practices and the drive towards that. Right? We have this drive towards uh, identifying what your hypotheses are before you collect the data, sharing your analysis plan to prevent uh, fraudulent data practices like p-hacking, for example. And we have journals that assign digital badges to people who actually do this pre-registration of hypotheses now. There's a drive to share research materials, for example. And you have digital badges assigned by journals like Psychological Science for just that. To enable replication, you need to be able to share uh, your materials. Of course, once you've published, uh, then you want to be able to share your raw data as well. This helps guard a discipline against, for example, data fraud and fabrication of data, but it also just furthers science, cumulative science. And you have badges for that. When it comes to statistical analyses, people are moving more and more away from expensive, exorbitantly expensive platforms like SPSS to open source platforms like R, which is more and more becoming a standard in my discipline. We talk about peer review, and many, many journals are experimenting with open peer review now, where the names are actually attached at the end of it. So it's not completely double blind either. It holds people more accountable. I think we all know about the, you know, the third review or the second reviewer problem. And then finally, open access publishing. This ridiculous idea that publicly funded research that's being paid by the taxpayers 
should then be hidden behind a paywall. So if the public wants to read the fruits of my labor, they have to pay $45 to El Sevier. And I should add, it's public funding, extra extraordinary public funding, together with volunteer work in the form of peer review, which equals record profits for El Sevier, for example. It's a ridiculous model, and I think we're moving more and more away from that. So in many ways, when I think about this, I think about the central philosophy. And, I, I, and an open education, open pedagogy, and open science feels like different manifestations of different facets of the same value hierarchy to me. And so finally, I think I said earlier that open education anyway is something of a social justice issue. But I think that's only the beginning. That's the easiest case to make when we talk about cost savings to students. But what I think it truly holds a lot of value is in its potential for pedagogical innovation. I think institutions have a remarkable amount to gain by looking into the benefits of open education, even if it's as a supplementary resource, reviewing, redesigning assignments, thinking about how students contribute to this, and thinking about it in terms of how we practice scholarship and science as well. This is a massive, massive movement, and it is coming. It is something that's going to challenge us in many ways. And I think, again, there are tremendous benefits to being at the crest of this wave in, instead of being in its wake. So, thank you for listening, and I hope Thank you. Thank you.